Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Compare's yearly review of the UK wealth management industry. And first, I must thank each of our sponsors, Objectway, Athena Global and Avalok, for their support in the running of this webinar. Well, what a year 2020 was. So as the nation battled the COVID-19 pandemic, many industries started to panic and even went into survival mode, but not to wealth management. So as a result that I'll share with you later show, this industry has shown remarkable resilience and actually managed to deliver some record results in spite of the radical change in working conditions and the huge volatility in the markets. Now, in today's webinar, alongside my presentation of the latest trends, I am delighted to be joined by two other guest presenters before we will then finish the webinar with a Wealth Management CEO panel discussion. So without further ado, let's kick off the webinar with our first speaker. So at the invitation of our sponsor, Athena Global, I'm very pleased to introduce Charles Radcliffe, an AI ethics, technology governance and ESG specialist from Ethics Grade. Well, welcome, Charles, and over to you. Thank you very much, James. Um, it's really great to be here this afternoon. Um, and uh, yeah, just want to reiterate my thanks to uh, Athena for um, inviting me to speak and present this afternoon and also to the team at Compare for putting together this uh, this event uh, today. Um, I don't know what you mean, James, about 2020 being an exceptional year. I can't possibly uh, have any clue what uh, what you're referring to there. For me, it was, it was a year like any other. I um, started the year heading up AI at Fidelity um, and then decided that um, there was such a big opportunity in the ESG space um, that it was probably the most perfect time in human history to leave a well-paid corporate job and start up a, a fintech. And... Um, yeah, by the beginning of March last year, I was um, maybe having a few regrets, but <laughs> here I am 15 months later, and um, I can honestly say it was the best thing I've done. Um, the ESG space that probably needs no introduction at all for anyone on this call, but I, I guess what does need introduction is the idea that um, AI ethics um, and corporate digital responsibility is a ESG issue. And that's very much what we've focused on at Ethics Grade over the last year. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about this. I haven't got any slides you'd be pleased to hear. I'm just going to um, shoot from the hip and, and hopefully um, not get booted off uh, when I'm still rabbiting on in half an hour's time. I'm only joking, don't worry. Um, so in terms of um, corporate digital responsibility, this is a very new area, but essentially you know, what we're talking about here is a field about how organisations ought to be responsible with their digital technology and how to be thinking about um, the, the governance around uh, that technology strategy in the context of ESG. And I'm just going to give a few examples of why this might be relevant, and maybe this will spark a few ideas in terms of what people on this call might want to think about taking back into their day jobs tomorrow. Um, so uh, let's start with the environmental impacts of, 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 uh, of technology. And I think we owe uh, Elon Musk a great... Um, a great debt of, of gratitude for highlighting the environmental impact of computation on the world. Um, although I'm not quite sure exactly what motivated him to you know, double down on his crypto investments and then um, renounce it just a few days later, um, citing the environmental impact. But I guess um, the, the computational efficiency of systems is not something which many people have thought too much about in terms of um, in, in terms of the environmental impacts of their tech. But this is an issue which is only getting bigger as data sets get bigger and the fancy maths that power algorithmic systems get more complex. And so, you know, I think there's really a couple of things which organizations need to think about. Firstly, is the energy efficiency of their algorithmic systems and the extent to which they are uh, guiding developers to be looking at that as a, as a, as a principle. Um, and the second consideration is really the uh, the location strategy of their computes. And I'll give you an example from a, an industry um, a, and probably a company which all of us have used. Um, I won't mention them by name, but um, a company that, that provides essentially a satellite navigation service. Um, what, one of the things they realized is one of their greatest input costs was essentially the electricity bill of their data centers. And what they did was they thought about this problem long and hard and realized that they could push the computation of people's routes, the journey planning, down to the devices of people connected uh, via the app to their, to their system. And then they realized that actually they could not just get users to compute their own routes, um, but actually if users were connected via the app to their uh, platform, essentially what they had was a, a massive decentralized computational grid 
Um, and this was, you know, phenomenal for, for you know, their essentially, you know, pushing down the, the computation away from their, their data center, reducing the electricity bill, and on the face of it, reducing their CO2 impact. Um, and if you're all kind of about to do high fives and, you know, pat them on the back for doing this, then I guess I want to burst that bubble very quickly by saying, um, that's all very well and good, but the challenge there is that an iPhone is simply nowhere near as efficient a computational device than a, um, a, a, a an array of systems in a data center. Um, so, so, so these are the sorts of things which organizations, I guess, get wrong. And these are the sorts of things which get organizations labeled as what I would call watermelons, organizations that try to look green on the outside or do look green on the outside. But once you've scratched that surface very quickly, um, they've got a, a very different risk profile to the one that you thought they had. Um, there's lots of other examples of this. You know, where is your where is your data center? Uh, where where are your data center strategies? If your if your engineers are in Mumbai, for example, maybe it makes more sense to move the compute to Malmo. Um, the Swedish electricity grid is a lot more energy efficient um, and a lot less pollutive than India. So there's lots of questions around this which organizations can think about. Um, and then there's also digital waste um, as a as a consideration as well. Um, you know, what is your what is your strategy around upgrading systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, environmental impact is probably something which few people have thought about, um, but I, I'm glad to say that the social impact of, of machine learning is something which is much more familiar to people because, you know, sadly we've had those examples where um, there's been bias and discrimination which has inadvertently slipped into algorithmic systems. Um, and um, and I think you know, the spotlight on social justice has, has really been turned up, you know, quite a few notches over the last couple of years, and that's you know that's a really good thing. But it's important not just to recognise as an issue, but it's important to have some consistent governance in place to address this. And I think very helpfully, the European Commission has started to set us off on a on a on a course here. They proposed or they have proposed um, a draft set of regulations on AI on the 21st of April this year. It's going to be a few years before they're enforced. Um, indeed, they've got to go through the political process at the European Parliament before they um, become enforceable. Um, but essentially what the European Commission are proposing is that organisations um, who are using machine learning for high-risk activities, and that's still to be defined, what high-risk exactly is, um, organisations need to ensure that they have the right quality management systems and the risk management systems in place. And for those of us in financial services, you know, this would be very familiar disciplines that would be nothing new to be seen here. Um, but I think what we're seeing is, it is, is, a, is a different level of rigour being expected of developers in this field. Um, and the penalties for getting this wrong are, are, are quite significant. 6% is the, is the highest penalty proposed under the, under the new AI regulation, which is 50% higher than it was under GDPR. The story of GDPR, I mean, I was running a data analytics company 10 years ago. And so um, I saw GDPR kind of as a storm on the horizon. And frankly, um, incorrectly, I, I kind of missed the boat. Um, by the time I realized what a big impact GDPR was going to be on everyone, it was already too late. Um, and so I very much focused on these AI regulations from the EU because the thing I really want to make sure that organizations avoid this time around is not that we had that kind of frantic rush just before the May deadline um, of everyone trying to fall over themselves to become compliant. At least this way, we've got a few years head start on ourselves. And I think for most organizations experimenting or innovating with AI machine learning or automation solutions, there's a good, good opportunity to do that. And then finally, there's the um, they're the other governance aspects in, 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 in question. And so what we've seen over the last three, four years is we've seen organizations really fall over themselves to, um, to promote their AI ethics principles. Um, and, you know, you can imagine the process they've gone through. They've all got together in a room and got some post-it notes out. Or since COVID, we've used Miro or one of those other um, post-it note equivalent apps um, and they've agreed on the six or seven, you know, m you know, least offensive words that everyone can agree upon, you know, justice, fairness, equality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but apart from looking good as a piece of marketing, this isn't very helpful. Uh, it's not very helpful to those on the front line who are developing these systems or promoting these systems. And it's certainly not very helpful in terms of ensuring that um, the board and senior leadership 
have got the right risk levers in place to make sure that the organization doesn't do anything wrong. And so really the, the, the key thing is, is making sure that organizations have the right structure in place to manage these digital ethics questions um, and making sure that that structure is, is the thing that's generating the principles. And those principles in turn are used to give operational guidance to those developing the systems on the ground. And, um, and you know, that's really the key, the key discipline. I think the responsibility here is, I mean, a lot of people are arguing in my field for the existence of a chief digital ethics officer, which is a bit of a mouthful and a bit of role inflation, if I've ever seen it. Um, I think this is the job of the chief digital officer um, of organizations um, to be accountable for these things and, and therefore for the board and, and the senior technology, technology leadership to make sure that that corporate strategy and, and corporate governance is connected back down to uh, those operational controls. So I'll stop there. I think that's probably enough to, uh, to start with on this question of, of, of corporate digital responsibility. Um, and um, yeah, once again, just big thank you to, to Athena and to uh, the team at Compare for putting on this event. Um, back to you, James. Oh, thank you very much, Charles. So it's now my turn to go through some of the, the latest trends that we've seen in the UK wealth management industry. And uh, I should pre-warn you that this is a very stats heavy presentation, but we will be sharing the slides after the, the webinar. So by no means feel that you need to memorize all the figures I'm about to show you. But here we are on my first slide. So the data I'm sharing you today has been compiled from our extensive annual benchmarking survey where Currently, we're tracking 157 firms. So these include execution-only stockbrokers, full-service wealth managers, investment managers, uh, and investment managers, which I, I've actually combined today because their business model is becoming increasingly similar to each other. And then finally, we have the private banks. And in the case of the wealth, man wealth managers, they're all required to um, provide discretionary services, so thereby excluding the larger group of IFAs. And that the firms in our survey come in a variety of sizes. So we've got some with a couple of hundred million of assets under management, ranging up to some with well in excess of 50 billion. And interestingly, one of the first findings is that the numbers of firms in our survey is actually, is actually down year on year. So we've seen an increase in M&A activity across the sector. And so consolidation is increasingly becoming a factor. Uh, let's now move on to some of the results. And so if we could please move on to the next slide. Now, this for me is a remarkable result to start with. And here we've got the total investment assets split by the firm types. So when COVID struck in the first quarter of 2020, markets crashed overnight. And in the space of a few weeks, over 150 billion was lost from the industry. So it very much was facing a crisis at that point. But the wealth management industry then very much showed its strength, it showed its resilience and the ability to bounce back remarkably quickly. So by the end of the third quarter, all of those lost assets have been recovered and leaving the final quarter for growth. And amazingly, the industry actually finished the year with a record 1.15 trillion of assets, which is close to 100 billion more than the previous record, which was as at the end of 2019. And as you can see, there was a, it was a good year of growth across each of the firm types. So the private banks topped the charts with 14% growth. Exo stockbrokers achieved growth of 12%, and then the combination of full service wealth managers and investment managers were up by 4%. And it also should be noted that there was a significant merger, and so a large amount of assets actually transferred from the full service wealth managers to the private banks, which stunted the growth as shown in, in the red blocks. At the same time, it obviously helped the growth of the private banking group. So let's now see which um, mandate type has grown by the most. And the story of the, the past few years has very much been the rise of discretionary and non-managed and the demise of advisory managed services. And 2020 was no different in this respect. So discretionary assets after growth in both bespoke and the more standardized MPS um, increased by 54 billion. And then you've got non-managed assets were up by 32 billion. So that just leaves the advisory managed assets which are up by a meagre 8 billion. And it's actually still lower than it was three years prior. And therefore, this is a service that very few firms are now promoting, which is actually little surprise given the, the small margins associated with it, which are, I'll go into more detail later. But if we could move on, please. 
Now, in previous years, we've seen that market movements can have a large influence on the overall asset growth of these firms. I mean, here are the asset flows of just the wealth managers, so I've excluded the XO brokers. So in 2018, the negative market movement was the key reason why firms reported a rare year-on-year -year reduction in assets. However, the reverse was true for 2019, where actually good market movement helped to boost the asset values. And then we've got 2020. So although the markets recovered and we did get some growth, so 17 billion in terms of market growth in that year, it's actually the net new asset flows that were the key reason why wealth managers reached their record asset levels. So at 123 billion, the level of inflows was far higher than we've seen in previous years. And firms should very much be commended for this, especially as it was in a working environment, but there's no face-to-face -face contact with prospective clients. And so it's much harder to gain the trust from these clients. Now, admittedly, 30 billion of those inflows was acquired assets, but that still leaves a very healthy 93 billion of organic inflows. Also to the firm's credit, they've kept outflows under control. Meaning that, meaning that net new business totaled 51 billion or 6% of the start of year asset values. And so to, to finish off the review of assets, please can we now move on to my slide showing the breakdown by the asset classes. Now, the main takeaway from this slide is the steady movement towards collectives and away from direct securities, or at least when you review them as a percentage of total investment assets. In fact, in absolute terms, there was good growth in each of the asset classes. So collective assets increased by 47 billion, direct securities are up by 40 billion. And it was only cash, which had a small 4 billion rise and alternatives with a 3 billion rise that reported small increases. And so collective based investments such as unit trusts, OICs and the increasingly popular ETFs are likely to be at the core of most portfolios. And soon the industry is going to be above the 500 billion mark invested in these. And it currently stands at 489 billion. But how does this asset growth translate into revenues? So let's find out on my next slide. So here, and now naturally, when asset values rise, uh, so do revenues. So therefore, it may be of little surprise that revenues have grown to an all-time high of 7.65 billion. So once again, the wealth management industry has set a new record in a year where many other industries have suffered. And if we dive into the individual firm types, the best performance came from EXO brokers, rising by a substantial 20%, and they're now earning close to double what they were in 2015. Then with the additional boost of the merger, private banks were up by 9%, but in contrast, full service wealth managers and investment managers had to report a small reduction of just 2%. But in the case of the wealth managers, you may have noticed that the revenue growth has fallen short of the asset growth and shown that it's not necessarily been clean sailing for these firms with some income streams being very much under pressure. So let's move on to the next slide showing the revenue composition. So here we've got the, the top three revenue streams for each of the firm types. So I'm going to start with the, the EXO brokers and their standout change was in commissions. So after a phenomenal year of trading, commissions almost doubled year on year and once, became the, once again became the number one revenue stream for these firms. Custody and admin fees uh, still very much remain important, but were flat year on year. And in third place, we have net interest income, which actually took a hit in 2020 as interest rates remained low. And then for the full service wealth managers and the investment managers, by far the largest revenue stream is investment management fees, investment management fees. And these actually reduced slightly year on year despite the asset growth. And that is potentially a sign of some reductions in the charges. But trade volumes have also been good for these firms, so it's helped a, a healthy rise in commissions. And then we've got wealth planning fees in third place. So the growth here looks pretty small for wealth planning fees, but it would have been far greater were not for a large amount of these fees actually moving over to the private banking group as a result of the merger. Then within the private banks, we've seen excellent growth in terms of investment management fees and commissions. But the only area of concern currently appears to be with net interest income. So it is very much a vital revenue stream for these firms, but it's on a, it is on a downward trend, and that seems to be continuing so far in 2021. So it's, therefore, it's important for these firms to increase their focus on wealth services, thereby reducing the reliance on income from other services such as banking and lending. 
Next slide, please. So I briefly touched upon potentially a reduction in charges. So I've just got some evidence of this. And now this chart shows the average revenue return for both discretionary and advisory managed assets. And in both cases, we've seen a steady decline over the years. And then there was a further 0.01% of AUM reduction in 2020 for the average. Now for discretionary, I still would say this leaves some room to actually make some profit. But for the advisory managed services, a revenue return of just 0.48%, I struggle to see how this can continue, especially as often the amount of work involved with these services is actually more than discretionary. So it's therefore no surprise that fewer firms are offering advisory managed services and instead are actually opting for a mix of discretionary and financial planning. On to the next slide, please. Now, I mentioned the phenomenal trade volumes for the EXO brokers, and so here are the stats to back that up. Now, typically, a very good year would be a tap between 18 and 20 billion of trades in that year. But in 2020, in the first six months alone, it met that figure. And the market volatility, market volatility is very much driven an onslaught of investors buying and selling predominantly equities. And the increase is to such an extent that come the end of the year, we'd had a total of 36 million trades, smashing any previous record by at least 16 million. So clearly, if there's one firm type that has very much thrived during this pandemic, pandemic, it is the EXO brokers. And as further encouragement for these firms, actually the very high level of trading has continued so far in 2021. And the next slide, please. And obviously one reason why Having high trade volumes is great for EXO firms is because it's very common for them to charge a commission on for each of these trades. So although some firms have entered the market and are advertised on commission-free trading, most still charge around 10 to 12 pounds a trade. And therefore, as you can see from the red line, we're still getting an average commission per trade of 10 pounds 28. But the blue line shows a slightly, um, well, it's showing total revenue per trade and it's painting a slightly different picture. So in 2018, 2019, there was good growth in this measure with the rise in custody and admin fees as well as platform fees. Therefore, though trade volumes were flat during that period, overall revenue was increasing and therefore total revenue per trade increased. But the reverse has then happened in 2020. So the growth in trading has been to such a level that it's actually dwarfed any increase in fees. Plus also it's been a period when there's been reduction in other income streams such as net interest. So therefore it's driven down the overall revenue per trade. But still, I'm sure many EXO firms will be in favor of maintaining the high level of trading that we're currently seeing, even if it is at a smaller overall revenue per trade. But now what I've shown so far has largely been actually very positive, so records have been broken, but it's not all good news for the wealth management industry. And so I'm now gonna move on to costs and a record that firms would rather avoid. Now, Cost control has proven to be exceptionally difficult, with total costs rising by 8% to 5.95 billion. And in some cases, this is because firms are investing, and I very, very much support this, as we embrace the, the next stage of the digital revolution, for example, in wealth management. But what concerns me the most is that consistently total costs are actually rising at a faster rate than revenues. And so many firms are reporting margin compression. And so I then wanted to look and see if there's a particular de department that is driving up these costs. So if we could move on, please. Well, in the case of wealth managers, the initial focus would normally be the, the front office professionals. But actually, as a percentage of total costs, when you combine all the staff costs and non-staff costs allocated to each department, it, it's reduced from 44.3% to 43.6%. And in contrast, the percentage from the front of support has increased and that's increased by 0.5%. And this is good to see in my eyes, as by bolstering these support teams, it should reduce the administrative burden on the front office professionals, allowing them to boost productivity. And if we then look at the excess stockbrokers, the two key movements are the rise in dealing and operations, and that coincides with the significant increase in trade volumes. And then we've seen a pickup in the marketing department costs. But the main thing that I wanted to bring out from these two charts is that actually, if you look at the year on year change in percentages of the cost proportions, they've only been very small across all of the departments. So that's implying that we've seen cost rises across the board. 
And so if firms want to address the issues of cost increases, they've got to look for solutions that support the entire business and not just one department. Next slide, please. So this one takes a slightly different look at costs. So rather than using departmental costs, I've taken, I've reviewed literally all costs that are directly associated with IT and operations. So we've got here staff costs, non-staff costs, any group transfer charges, and any outsourced costs that are either IT or operations related. And what we see is a, a sharp rise in these costs, especially in IT. So total IT costs surged by 119 million, and it's by far the largest year on year increase we've ever seen. And now over 900 million is spent on IT alone. And clearly firms are investing and digital is the main focus, but the pandemic has acted as a catalyst for this with digital engagement looking like it's here to stay now. And I'm sure face-to-face -face meetings will return when all the restrictions are lifted, but it's apparent that technology is going to play a key part in ongoing interactions and the wealth management industry seems to be playing, playing catch up in this area. But continuing on the theme of costs, we can now move on to my next slide, which is looking at the non-staff costs. And across all firms, we've now got over 2 billion being spent on non-staff costs. And that's up from um, just under 1.8 billion the previous year. And as a percentage of revenue, it's increased by 2%. But looking at these cost lines, given my previous slide, it's probably no surprise at all to see that there's been a large rise in IT and information services costs and, um, and also in operations non-staff costs. We've also seen a large jump in compliance costs and professional fees. So the regulatory burden is there, very much remains, and firms continue to seek external advice. But the only non-staff cost line to reduce year on year was staff expenses. And by this, I mean client entertainment costs and other expenses such as travel expenses. So obviously with staff working from home and unable to meet clients in person, travel expenses are naturally going to reduce. And then firms themselves have been more restricted by what they can do in terms of client entertainment. So again, that will bring down these costs. And overall, it's resulted currently in a saving of £64 million. So let's now take a look at staff numbers. Well, when the pandemic started, firms naturally became cautious and recruitment levels dropped. However, since then, we've seen these rise again and actually approximately 900 additional staff were employed, employed by the industry come the end of the year. Private banks have been the largest recruiters, so a large proportion of this increase in staff is because of the merger and the staff moving across from the full service wealth manager group. But still, even if we excluded those, there has been good growth in staff numbers among the private banks. So I now want to provide some focus on what is the larger proportion of these staff, and it's, that is the, the front office professionals. So in 2020, there are just over 11,000 front office professionals across all of the firms. And if you compare that to five years ago, it's about an increase of, of around 800. And the reason I've put together this slide is to actually show the change in the structure and the change in the expertise of the front office professionals over this period. So we've seen a good rise in sales staff. So these staff are predominantly targeting IFAs and other, other intermediaries to sell the discretionary services to them. But then we've actually seen a reduction in relationship managers. So instead of the more traditional relationship manager and investment manager combination, more firms are either relying on the investment manager to do both the management of the relationship and the underlying assets, or they're opting for a combination of investment managers and financial planners. And the financial plans are included under other product specialists within this table. And also one thing that is clear across the board is that the average cost of these front office, front office professionals is rising. But then it raises the question, are firms actually getting value for money from these staff? So if we can move on to the next slide. Well, here we've got the, the front office productivity statistics. And the blue line shows the average managed assets per front office professional, and that's gradually been rising, and it now stands at 72 million. Then in red, we have the total revenue that these front office staff are responsible for. So on a per FOP basis, this too has uh, encouragingly been rising, albeit not so much in 2020, where it's very flat year on year at 483,000. But arguably, the most important line to answer my previous question on value for money is the green line. 
So this is the margin or the, the difference between the revenue that they generate and their staff cost. And this implies that actually firms are getting more value out of the front of a staff each year. And since 2015, it's improved by £57,000 for each front office professional employed. But is this enough to cover the rising costs across the business, including all of those non-staff cost increases we saw on my previous slide? If we could move on, please. Well, in the case of the private banks, I'm afraid to say the resounding answer is no to that question, as pre-tax profit margins have dropped significantly from 24.1% to 17.6%. For full service wealth managers and investment managers, they've seen a small rise in margin, but at 19.2%, I'm sure many will be striving for higher margins than this. But far ahead of these curves, though, are the XO brokers with a weighted average margin of 48% and a figure that continues to rise. However, the key word in that sentence is weighted. So yes, the XO sector as a whole looks to be very lucrative, but this value is very much driven by the excellent performance of a small group of firms who happen to be the largest and then therefore bringing up the peer group figures. So if we move on to our next slide, we'll see a different reality. So although the, the XO market as a whole has an average margin of 48%, only one in five of those firms actually reported a margin in excess of 40%. So you, in fact, have a larger proportion of firms that reported a loss. Therefore, EXO trading can be a fantastic business model and it can deliver very high profits. But at the same time, it is a difficult model to master, and so not all will succeed. And for the full service wealth managers, we have the, the largest cluster of firms earning margins of 20 to 40 percent, which actually is good to see. But again, there's a wide variance from one firm to the next, and we have 18 percent of loss making and a further 10 percent earning very little profit with margins of less than 10%. And then finally, we have the private banks who witnessed that large, large squeeze in profit margins. And this, to the extent now that we have no private banks earning a margin in excess of 40%, and most now are actually below the 20% mark. And so the industry is growing, and we've seen record levels of assets and record levels of revenues, but with the pressure on margins, it suggests that there is a lack of scalability. So if we could move on to my last slide, please. Now, for a firm to be scalable in a year, it needs to be profitable, it needs to achieve revenue growth, and it needs to improve profit margin all at the same time. And in the past years, I've looked at the, the number of firms that are scalable in each year. But, but this year, I wanted to take a slightly different approach and instead review if the firm types as a whole were delivering scalable results. And based on the, the number of red crosses on this screen, it's not great news. So um, for EXO, with the larger firms leading the way, the results on the whole have been good. So we've had scalable years seven out of the past 10 years. But for the wealth managers, scalability definitely seems to be lacking currently. In the case of the full service wealth managers and investment managers, sectors failed to be scalable in each of the past five years. And normally they achieve revenue growth, but then margins are reducing. Actually in 2020, it was a rare instance when margins increased in fact, they failed to increase year, revenue year on year. Then for the, the private banks, the margin compression has taken effect and they are now actually on a run of three years without being scalable. But it's not all doom and gloom here. And I'm confident that these results can be turned around. And actually this um, brings me to a good point to, to end my presentation and introduce our next speaker who could well have some of the solutions to the scalability conundrum that I've just shown. So I'm therefore very pleased to welcome Tarek Khan from Objectway, who's today going to be discussing how digital change can enable scalable performance. Well, welcome Tarek and over to you. Thanks a lot, James. Um, and it's great to be here with all of you today. Um, so the objective of my presentation is to discuss how digital change can enable scalable performance. Um, and I'm going to focus on the impact that digital change has on operational efficiency and also on client growth. Now, both of these are really important measures for performance, but also requirements uh, to achieve scale. I'll also share some insights from a recent case study so we can see some real life relevant examples of what firms are actually achieving. And let's see what is possible. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is the agenda that I'm going to cover. Give you a few seconds to have a look at it. Um, so let me start by talking a bit about Objectway. 
So for those of you who don't know, Objectway is a global fintech firm with over 30 years of local experience in partnering with UK wealth managers. And Objectway provides wealth managers with a fully integrated front to back office software solution. And you can see a couple of our clients there have had some color. And also interestingly, uh, we host 60% of our clients on the private cloud um, as they look to achieve scale. Um, let me give you some details on the solution, um, which I think you'll find interesting. Ne next slide, please. So Object to Waves Wealth Tech Suite uh, is modular, it's fully front to back, and it covers the business cycle. But I guess the most important thing uh, for us, um, and hopefully for you to know, is that we really try and help wealth managers achieve four things. So one is to help them to, to uh, enable them uh, with process automation. So for example, straight through processing really give back time to employees and increase operational efficiency. Second is to enhance advisor productivity. So through, for example, modules such as the portfolio management solution, which is integrated uh, with the risk engine. Thirdly, it is there to improve the client experience and hopefully increase client engagement through modules such as client lifecycle management um, and the investor portal where clients can receive uh, tailored reports and information uh, on the go. And last but not least, it's there to innovate investment services. And, and a good example is the portfolio optimizer. So this actually uses artificial intelligence um, to suggest products or portfolios based on client preferences. And um, hopefully that's given you a good idea of who we are and um, what we do. Let, let's have a look at some of the challenges. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to focus on just two, as I mentioned earlier. On inefficient IT and operations, um, that being the first one. So most firms are burdened with legacy infrastructure. Um, so lots of disparate IT systems which don't communicate that well with each other. So as a result, um, there's usually lots of manual workarounds, and this feeds into inefficient processes. Um, obviously, this increases operational risk. Um, this also increases errors and wastes a lot of time. Okay, and we're going we're gonna to talk about this. The second is changing client expectations. Now, James already mentioned, um, because of the way that we've been living over the past 12 months or so, I think client expectations, digital is much more at the forefront. It's not the only answer, for sure. Um, however, I think clients are now expecting a more personalized uh, experience from digital, but also from face-to-face, -face, and we'll talk about that a bit more. They're expecting, for example, personalized updates, uh, personalized reporting, and they see these as real differentiators uh, of firms. Uh, next slide, please. So let's go through each one of them. So inefficient IT and operations. This is actually taken from James's data. Uh, I won't go through all of it, but basically what can, we, what can we take from this slide? First of all, there's a huge variation in terms of IT costs and operational costs. And remember, I'm just uh, highlighting the quartiles here, so the absolute numbers are much wider. One in three wealth managers reported a pre-tax profit margin of 10% or less. So that's, in, that's including uh, firms that made a loss. And seven out of 10 of all firms are actually not scalable. However, on the positive side, average pre-tax profit margin is 23%. It's healthy. And James has shown how some of the firms are doing exceptionally well. So this is telling us that although there's huge variation, there's also huge room uh, for improvement. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to share some insights from some research that we're doing with senior executives at the moment. It's ongoing, so this is literally hot off the press. Um, and the, the title of the research is Digital Transformation in the Next Normal. So the first question that we ask here is on a scale of one to five, with five being the most important, how important are digital services in achieving business objectives? And you can see, uh, if you look at the top two, providing existing services in a cost-efficient, more scalable way. Digital is extremely important. Acquiring new customers, digital is important to that. And then you go for developing existing customers and retaining existing customers. Now, if you look at the bottom, it actually shows how wealth managers feel that their current IT is placed. So most of them feel that it's not efficient, and most of them are three between one and five is on the fence in terms of they're not confident um, about whether it's scalable enough to support the business. So this is telling us, look, 
wealth managers absolutely believe that digital can help them in provide in in uh, their in uh, reaching their business objectives. However, at the moment, there's currently a big gap. Um, we did this uh, research about six months ago as well, and there, seven out of ten firms said that they would be reviewing their IT, with half of them expecting to change over the coming 24 months. Now, having spoken to many of these firms and speaking to them at the moment, this has only been accelerated by COVID and also by factors such as ESG. So I expect that this gap uh, between desired state and current state will, will narrow. Um, next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about client engagement. Now, I've got two slides on here. Now, the first I want to show is the threat from fangs. These, this is a changing client expectation. Okay? Fangs, uh, for those of you who don't know, are uh, big tech in the US. So Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Um, and this was actually done with high net worth investors. So if you have a quick look, uh, the green circles are called the wow impact. So this is where investors thought, right, this touch point, gives me a real wow impact to my firm. It helps me to differentiate between my firm. The orange circles at the top are where clients were least satisfied uh, with their service. And then the blue circles in the middle are where they believe that the fangs, or you could substitute that for digitally savvy firms, uh, could provide a better service. And I think um, in summary here, the main thing that's coming here is that clients are not very happy about the personalized level of interaction uh, with their wealth manager. And most of them, well, not most of them, but a significant amount of them think that the fangs or a digitally savvy firm could do a bit better. Okay, uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, this is taken from some research that Objectway did, uh, and some of you may have read the article. Um, it was in the FT this month, I think on the 7th of June. Uh, so if you want a link to it, then let me know. But it's about hyper-personalization. And this is telling us that more than half of the surveyed wealth managers, and there were, I think, just on, there were 48 firms, are actually working on a hyper-personalization strategy. So one, it's important to firms, they're working on it. Most of them at very early stage. Four out of 10 are actually implementing hyper-personalized portfolio construction and recommendations. So for example, that, that is the example I gave you of Object Way's portfolio optimizer. Clearly, six out of 10 still aren't doing that. Um, and only a quarter can actually effectively rely on behavioral sciences and sentiment analysis. And I guess the important point here is that two thirds, two -thirds actually do want to. Um, the obstacle here is actually not the lack of know-how. It's more to do with the fact that data is very jumbled um, uh, and it's not accurate enough. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we've already seen that digital change can help with operational efficiency. Um, and we've seen that firms are actually working on a personalized strategy as well. So how does this really tie in with achieving scalable performance? Well, um, the case study should give us the answer to that. So this is from uh, one of Object Waste clients, and they leveraged uh, Object Waste Wealth Tech Suite. And, uh, they had the following business goals, basically to improve operational efficiency um, and to improve profit margin and also grow the client base. Um, and we worked uh, with this client and decided that the best way to implement change was through an incremental approach. So there were three phases. So the first phase was implementing a portfolio management solution. And this went and uh, integrated with a legacy backend. And this was basically allowing advisors uh, to, to deal with client preferences in real time. The second phase uh, involved uh, an investor portal. So this way clients were receiving information in real time or on the go as they wanted it, hopefully tailored information. And then the third was a client lifecycle management. So this dealt with um, prospecting all the way to onboarding as well as suitability um, and ad hoc events. So, this took 18 months. So I think before we go on to the results, I should make it clear, look, this is not kind of uh, an overnight thing. It's not a walk in the park, it's challenging. Uh, but I think the rewards are certainly there. And let, let's have a look at them, please. And next slide, please. 
So I'll give you a few uh, seconds to have a look at it, and I'll just point some things out as well. Um, you know, this client has had some fantastic results. So they, they took a checkpoint after 18 months of implementation. So they've grown the AUM by 25%, which is fantastic. They've increased digital penetration from quite a low level of 30% to 50%, and they're expecting this to grow to 80% in the next three years. And advisor capacity has actually increased by 25%, and they're expecting this to get to 55% increase in the next three years. Imagine how much more time advisors now have with their clients. And then they've boosted satisfaction rate in terms of uh, client, enge client engagement to a good net promoter score of above 50 um, in four years. So they've had some fantastic results. Uh, that, again, it's not been without challenge, but I think um, definitely that the, the cake is at the end. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I've got a couple of key takeaways here. The main drivers for digital change include achieving scale and attracting new clients. Clients expect more personalization. And I should point out here that it's not just about the fancy digital front end. Some clients don't want the digital front end. But if technology improves, end client research shows that 75% of clients are actually more likely um, to engage in more face-to-face. -face. Firms should prioritize critical touch points. If you go back to the bang slide, and that's something that fir firms should cover. Uh, it's okay, and we'll, we can go out. Yeah. Um, digital change, as we've seen from the case study, can transform operational efficiency and it can enable scalable growth. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to end by just saying thank you for your attention. And you've got my details there. So if you want any more information or you want to be involved in some of our ongoing research, we'd, we'd love to have you there. So let me know. And if you have any comments, then uh, please let me know. I'd love to hear them. OK, I'm back to James. Well, thank you very much, Tarek. So that brings us now to our final section of the webinar, which is our panel discussion. So please note that if you wish to pose a question to the panel, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your, of your screen. So feel free to use that. And I'll look to get as many of these questions answered as possible. Now, today on the panel, I'm delighted to be joined by Jonathan Pollin, the CEO of Sanlam, and we also have Peter Flavel, the CEO of Coots, and they're to provide their first-hand views of running wealth management firms during the pandemic. And also providing the expert view from the supplier side, we have John Wilson, the UK MD of Avalok. So very much welcome to each of you, and thank you for your time today. But let's get cracking with the first question. And I'll start with you, Jonathan, on this one. So. We've seen a large increase in IT expenditure over the past year, probably the largest jump we've ever seen. And most of this is probably in digital services. So a bit of a two-part question. So do you foresee this similar growth continuing in previous in the next few years? Uh, or is it more of a, a one-off because of the pandemic that we've seen the rise? And where do you think a switch to more digital services could make a positive difference? Um. James, thanks very much, um, and, a, and a, a great question. Uh, I think in the first instance, I think uh, to ask your question, we've only just in this industry and, and sector scraped the surface of the uh, spend on tech that we're going to require in the next five to 10 years. Uh, you know, we are very much behind the curve and um, we like many, uh, many businesses have spent the last two or three years spending a huge amount of money in retooling our, our back office, outsourcing it, trying to uh, concentrate on those areas that are core for us and outsource those, those areas uh, that are not core. And uh, look, one of the greatest accelerators, I think, to this has, has been uh, uh, C19, because if there were detractors into the requirement for uh, this industry uh, to digitalize more convincingly, uh, then they will have had it proven uh, by what's been happening in, in the last uh, uh, 12 to 18 months. And um, we all managed to adopt and do very well, I think, uh, adopting but very simple tech in terms of Zoom, uh, Teams, uh, DocuSign, uh, Cool Portability, those sort of things. But the key point is that for years, 
our financial planners and our portfolio managers have told us that our, our clients don't want digitalization. And what has been proven is that our client appetite and acceptability of uh, the working virtually and digitally is far in excess of, of our financial planners and portfolio managers' uh, capabilities. Um, and uh, we must continue to, to invest. I think one of the questions you asked, um, I personally believe that IT today is our second biggest spend. In the next couple of years, it is going to be our biggest spend. And that means we're going to be spending more on IT and digitalizing than we possibly can do, uh, that we, than we do on people. The second key thing for me is uh, that those people, um, the only people in our industry who can be disruptors are actually ourselves. By significantly changing and turning our business model on its head, we can be the disruptors uh, that Tarek was talking about uh, in his uh, presentation because we have the connectivity to the clients. Why other, why Rubo hasn't worked in this country is because they can't get the clients to get to the scale to, to be able to allow them to be successful. Uh, we have that on a plate, in fact, and um, we're becoming victims of the fact that we have very, uh, a great number of clients who for years have been um, allowed to uh, be bespokely uh, uh, looked after. Uh, and we haven't invested in the tech to actually get the scale and to be at, get those profit metrics up, which you say, showed, James, to where they should be. Thank you, Jonathan. And, and Peter, would, would you agree that we've only just scraped the surface now and so there's going to be further investment? Yeah, of course, um, James, I quite agree. Look, what I don't agree with, though, is that, that COVID was, um, uh, was the catalyst. Um, we doubled our IT exp our technology expense um, in this year uh, from the last, and, and that was almost double the, the previous year. So these tech um, increases in spending has been well and truly planned for well ahead of, of the effects of COVID. What COVID did was cause us to spend a bit more, but not huge amounts, more of, of kit of getting people to work from, from home, uh, refurbish offices to get ready uh, for new ways of working when we get back there. And, and they're increased costs, but they're not significant relative to um, the underlying costs. And so we are going to see um, a significant move um, to digital, um, and that's for sales as well. So um, I, can, I can tell you that our digital sales have, have doubled uh, since, since last year. Um, and some of that's COVID with people being at, at home, and that's our, our Coots Invest, our online invest. It's really for simple, you know, ICEs and uh, simple top-ups, et cetera, um, and that can be done directly or, or with the help of, um, uh, of, of guidance from, uh, from advisors. And, and that's going to continue, and, and our advisors uh, see that as a positive. It's not a, it's not a negative. It allows them then to spend more time on the larger, more complex areas where they add the real value. And uh, most of that is still going to be face-to-face. -face. Now, face-to-face -face can be through a video screen, actually. Um, uh, video is still face-to-face, -face, so it's really physical versus virtual. The, the, um, the efficiency that comes uh, both from a client perspective and an advisor perspective of making use of things like Zoom or Teams, um, digital video technology is, is, an, is enormous, and that's going to stay with us. But many of clients I've been talking to are saying, look, if we're doing quarterly investment reviews with a the client, they're happy to do three of those um, on, on Zoom. But the fourth one, the annual one, they, they still want face-to-face, -face, so it's not to the exclusion um, of it. Um, and then I quite agree um, that there are lots in the industry that, um, are way behind here um, and they're really going to have to um, uh, jump up pretty quickly and it's it's I mean our, our IT spend won't get close to what we spend on on people but it's still going to be the second um, second largest and as much as we've spent in the last few years um, we're going to continue to spend more because we still have more straight through processing to do 
better client experience. We've got a, a new app um, coming out in the next uh, next short while, which will integrate all of our channels um, together, uh, provide seamless experience into into Coots Twenty Four. So that's a big a big step up on us. And then we've also launched what we call Four Forty, which is like a a LinkedIn uh, for our clients, so a private networking app for for our clients. Um, and that's in beta at the moment. Is getting really good um, uh, accolades. So that just just underlines that we're we're all going to get used to using digital much more. Our advisors um, uh, and our planners, etc., are all going to have to get used to bringing the use of digital technology in as an adjunct to what they do to make it a better client experience and not to somehow be a competitor to them. Thank you, Peter. Now, John, obviously, it seems the consensus is that the um, IT expenditure is going to increase, which is obviously great from your side of things as a supplier to the industry, but where can digital really make a difference? Um, well, I mean, I think digital makes the difference in terms of engagement with the client. And digital is a broad church, isn't it? So, you know, at a very superficial level, digital is effectively the you know, the online dialogue that can happen between a, um, a service provider, a wealth manager and, a, and an end client. But of course, if you look at digital in the round, it can include cloud, it can include AI, uh, as well as you know, the sort of the team's engagement that, we, uh, that we've grown to know and love over the course of the last 12 months or so. So I think that the, you know, the, the big steps forward with digital would be in um, creating better channels for um, frequent and high quality interaction with the end Customer and Avlock have released a, a, a new digital product in um, in recent months to do precisely that kind of WhatsApp for for advisors is to provide insight into the um, uh, the purchase preference preferences of the end client. So there's a wealth of financial information just based on the, the trades and transactions that wealth managers do. Uh, so again, understanding client preferences and kind of what's hot and what's not, uh, trading on that and using sort of Amazon-esque uh, type um, uh, uh, analytics to understand, you know, the kind of the preferences of people like you know, the, 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 the PLUs, uh, depending on how wealth managers segregate their, uh, their, their, their client base. Um, uh, and um, I think also in terms of you know, the management of the performance of the portfolio as well, so leveraging uh, the, the vast data streaming capabilities that are enabled by cloud and also the AI analytics tools that um, allow us to draw conclusions from that. So I think in summary, you know, digital will um, uh, has come to the fore as um, uh, during the event of COVID, but um, I think as... Um, the economy recovers post-COVID, then you know the spend on IT and the reliance on digital will increase as we see uh, wealth managers um, compete to thrive um, as, uh, as as the demand increases. Uh, that will involve um, uh, enabling kind of more complex, and more agile operating models, further developing those digital channels, um, creating um, new and innovative. APIs that enable microservices and you know, loosely coupled and highly deployable best of breed services. Uh, and again, that kind of demand for data and insight will continue uh, at pace and that move to cloud. So I think there's multiple places where uh, digital is going to add value to wealth managers and their end clients. Thanks, John. And we'll, we'll stay with you, John. So um, we've seen that the industry as a whole appears to have quite major issues in terms of scalability. So it's good at growing revenues but margins are on their way down. So what do you believe are the, the main barriers to a wealth manager and business model that's actually stopping it from being scalable? And what can service providers do better to support sustainable and scalable growth in the future? So I think I think the main barriers are, are the environment that, that, that we, we work within, which is um, you know, a complex, demanding and volatile world. And, and wealth managers are striving for cost-efficient growth you know, within that environment, which is hugely challenging. Um, and as a result, um, they need to keep on reinventing themselves to best align with their, their clients' interests, as we've seen them do again and again and again, very, very successfully. So I think really where service providers can help uh, is the provision of innovative products and services to really help them better understand, engage with, and, and serve their clients. I mean, and I would group those into, into four key areas, I guess. 
um, insight. So I think I touched already on, you know, providing insight into growth opportunities by um, uh, better understanding your existing client base through the financial data that's generated, using predictive analytics uh, to identify growth opportunities both in your existing client base, you know, and, um, uh, and, and beyond. The second one would be personalization and reach and Tarek uh, talked about um, you know the personalization of, of propositions in, in, in his presentation um, and really uh, that involves providing products like Avalok Wealth where that enables sophisticated client profiling and portfolio construction to individually serve clients and automation to be highly responsive you know ensuring that underserved clients uh, are, are, are well attended to you know providing tools to kind of better visualize strategies and performance thirdly i talk about engagement um uh, i think in many ways kind of quality time is quantity time um so the enablement of web and mobile banking features and uh, and kind of whatsapp for private uh, private bankers self-service capability all of that uh, better permeates um, uh, the, the the wealth manager into the day to day lives of, of their clients, and then finally efficiency. You know, given that um, wealth managers are, are striving to deliver those scalable results in a cost efficient way, then um, uh, platforms like Avalok are uh, providing ninety five percent straight through processing for uh, you know for, for for instrument types. You know, providing um, software and, and and as a service type capabilities, the ability to raid to, to deal with a huge range of financial instruments. All of those, you know, enable the kind of the support of, a, of, of an ecosystem um, that, that ultimately serves to uh, enable um, wealth managers to, uh, to, to, to build scale, scalability in, in a highly challenging environment. Okay, uh, and Jonathan, what are the main barriers that you see stopping more wealth management firms from being scalable? Yeah, I think it, it's, it's there are two separate parts to it. And, and the first part is, is there's been an inability to, for, for uh, our industry to grow organically. Um, uh, and uh, um, that has uh, uh, created, if you like, uh, the, the lack of scale that people have been able to do and people have relied purely on, on um, non-organic growth, uh, consolidation, M&A activity uh, to, to achieve that growth. But I do think... Uh, that it also goes back to my earlier points, which is about the uh, unfriendliness, if you like, of, of our, our proposition today. Um, and I don't think there's anybody that's really got a truly um, proper uh, platform that allows a client to have their own financial ecosystem with all parts of their, um, of, of their wealth solution in front of them. Um, open banking gives us the ability, much better ability to do that. But nobody's cracked it yet. And I'm a, 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 a client of Peter's, so I haven't seen that yet. Um, and um, the, the, it, it is about being able to deliver the right technology to allow clients to have the same experience that they have in their day-to-day -day, uh, lives, where they can get actually today, banking apps are far easier for us to be able to control what we do, we can send money around the globe uh, the, by pushing a button. But uh, wealth management is, is, is behind that curve. And achieving that, and there is nobody that has that uh, front-to-back uh, uh, digital uh, solution uh, yet uh, to allow us to, to achieve it. So you have to achieve it by, by modular and adding, and adding different bits. And so I think those are the key things, as well as what we've said about uh, costs uh, and, and margin compression. And uh, margin compression will continue to come until we offer a service that people really feel they want to pay for. Okay. And Peter, would you agree? Or are there any other yeah. barriers? Well, there are a few things. And I'm glad, Jonathan. It's a wonderful client. Um, <laughs> uh, so, look, firstly, um, on your earlier uh, James, on your earlier graphs around um, private banking, just be careful on the margin for last year because obviously deposit margins are now down to where they've never been in any of our, our lives. So in the last year or so, you've seen the deposit margins um, decrease. And anyone that's got a decent-sized lending book, mortgage lending book, um, through IFRS, IFRS 9, they've taken considerable um, provisions which they had to, given the uncertainty around around COVID, 
So it's going to be really interesting to see how both of those um, both of those bounce back. So I uh, just be a little too a little careful about those those mar- that margin compression on the the banking and the and the lending because um, uh, they're cyclical in nature. What Jonathan just said though is that you know, quite rightly is margin compression on the investment side is going to continue. Um, the the rates at which some wealth managers charge entry fees, exit fees, hidden fees um, in this market is you know, remains in um, an interesting basket. Let's just leave it uh, at that. And and then the move to having more passive investments is really just going to um, decrease the margins there. And I quite agree. Uh, until we get to a level where people go, that's a fair price. Uh, they're not going to uh, continue. Um, so they are going to continue to, to compress. So the way I think about the scalability issue for, for the industry is firstly there's so much legacy infrastructure. Um, and I'm so pleased that one of my predecessors here um, uh, got rid of 16 or 17 different um, systems and put them all into, into Avalon. Um, and uh, whilst for your time, um, it was a pretty bumpy ride there, as I understand it, for a little while. But, but now we have one tech stack that integrates banking, lending and investments all on one tech stack. Um, now, there are, you'll go a long way around the world to find um, someone that's, that's got that. But as um, Jonathan was saying, that's just about what's held on us. On us. So the, 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 where we need to get to um, through open banking, through screen scraping, um, is the capacity to show a, client, a client's full balance sheet and p and uh, and cash flow. Uh, and no one, including the states, um, has yet been able to, to do that. And the states has better, in, um, better data management, public data management than we do in the UK. So I agree that's where we, where we need to get to. And then on personalisation. It needs to be scalable personalization because if you end up with too many exceptions to, to a policy, you don't you just your cost us go through the uh, through the roof. So um, it needs to be scalable and it needs to be built, um, which I'm sure Object Way and Avalot will say absolutely, that at the press of a button, when you make a tactical asset allocation change, at the press of a button, every discretionary portfolio is impacted. And is impacted and is executed with the push of a button. That's where we need to get to. And there's no one uh, apart from the institutional space uh, in this country that uh, is capable of doing that today. Okay. And but a couple of times um, there's been mention of um, charges. And do we feel that the um, there is room to increase the charges? Are, are well financial firms at the current averages? potentially undercharging, or that doesn't need to be a material difference before those charges can go up? I, I don't see how the charges can go up. Um, I'll be interested I'm to hear. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, that's just not, I don't even, I can't even, I can't even think of a, I can't even think of an area where you could increase uh, charges. Uh, they just need to come down. Um, you know, for, for online investing, you're talking, you know, 65 max um, if you're doing active management, active asset allocation. And then, as you know, you know, others are down at 20 basis points when they don't do active asset allocation. Um, that relative to what full service charges are, you know, there's a really big gap. So we have to prove again, as we've had to all through my career, that the advice that we give is worth the price that we charge for. But we have to have clarity around what we're charging. There's too much that is not clear as to what the clients are being being charged. Um, so I'm afraid um, if you're thinking that, that I've got some idea about <laughs> how charges are increasing, um, I, I don't think it's there. I think interest rates will increase. And for a business like mine, I can't wait for that. Um, <laughs> but, but other than that, I don't know what you think, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, I don't see... Um, uh, charges rising. What I do see is we have to get our own house in order um, uh, and to deliver the technology and to get to scale to allow us to reduce our price and to be much more competitive uh, in the marketplace. So I think it's uh, it's not for us, but the clients up for the uh, the clients is up for us to get our operating systems available to be able to deliver the deliver 
our product at the correct price. Can I can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question without notice? Because you said earlier, and I, I agree that the inorganic as a strategy to grow, unless you're filling a capability gap, and that's I think that's supportable. If it's just that, then I'm not a, a big fan of that as a as a growth strategy. But then when I look across the market, I I look at players that I think are just too small to continue to exist at the level that they're they're at. And so I I do think there'll be more consolidation um, to try and get some more scale to then get their cost to serve down. Um, But they're then going to have to digitise all of that to to keep their their costs going down. Would you, is that the way you see it or or not? I think... um... No, I, I think there will be a a significant level of continual uh, consolidation for the very reasons you say that the the cost of regulation is actually yeah. going to price small smaller businesses out of the marketplace. Uh, but so many, um, if you like, acquisitions fail if the plat the receiving platform hasn't got the robustness, the capability, yeah. and the functionality that it's required. Yeah. And everyone gets starry-eyed about it. It's all going to be easy. Yeah. <laughs> and then two years down the track, it's, you have to start again. Yeah, I've got a few thoughts from that myself, if I'm honest. <laughs> and uh, just to, to bring John into it as well, I mean, would you agree that there's going to be further consolidation? I mean, we've seen a lot of private equity firms uh, acquiring smaller firms and then looking to merge them together. So do you think that's going to continue? I think absolutely. I mean, I think margin pressure and competition and pursuit of growth and pension reforms, all, all of those things, low interest rates, take us in one direction, and that's kind of consolidation and, and vertical integration. But I, I don't think that's a that's a new thing. Um, uh, building on some of the comments from panelists earlier, I mean, the industry is quite cannibalistic, isn't it? Whether we're talking about insurance firms, so M and G acquiring Eccentric and James Hay acquiring Nucleus. You know, wealth managers till his acquisition of Smith and Williamson, or, or private equity, as you mentioned, and you know I think a lot of that private equity is driven by, as uh, as, as Peter was saying, um, kind of the size of some of the kind of the smaller firms out there, generational change in the advice community, and you know the cost pressures being experienced. Um, so I mean I think that will carry on for as long as there is um, uh, that there are returns to be made in, in in that area, and certainly from a from a technology perspective, you know, we see ourselves as a as a key enabler there, but we're also aware that the kind of the costs of, you know, implementations, you know, and some of these have been have very high profile, haven't they? Can can spiral out of control. So, um, you know, I think um, uh, mergers and, and, and acquisitions and cons- consolidation is not for the faint-hearted, and we need to um, pick our way through that very very carefully. But but yes, I mean, I see that. I see that continuing for you know for as, as long as kind of margin pressures increase and, and the pursuit of growth is there. Yeah, but as as you said, John, I mean it's you've got to get an investment return from it. And and the, the challenge I see is that the, the listed fund managers are, are listed wealth managers are trading on PEs of around 30. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you look at that and go, and then you look at the, the couple of recent transactions um, in the marketplace and you Look at what's being paid either relative to AUM or relative to profit or loss that the business is still making. And, you know, you can scratch your head at some of those numbers. Absolutely. Okay, so um, there's likely to be more consolidation, but obviously your organic inflows are going to be a vital part. So currently there's a massive reliance on referrals for those new business. Do we believe that the industry is overly reliant on referrals and it does very little in terms of marketing. So should they be marketing more or how do you actually increase brand awareness in the current environment? And I'll stay with John. So, I mean, I think referrals are critical, aren't they? I mean, what better advertisement is there for a service, I guess, in whichever industry uh, you're in? Um, And, um, uh, you know, to go back to some of the comments earlier around digital, I mean, digital provides so many great opportunities, however, to cost-effectively reach customers and, and create brand awareness whether that's you know ai to identify new seams of customers or new seams within your existing customers you know digital advertising attuned to you know, google searches or search engine op- optimized optimization um, but also content marketing and brand journalism i attended a really 
interesting talk just the other day. It was actually kind of the, the, the kickoff that we had internally around our, our new client success organization. And we had a really fascinating speaker there and he was urging us not to talk in just promotion or product, but to, to engage um, clients with, with stories. And he described a story as there's always got to be a dragon, i.e. some kind of threat. There's always got to be a knight, i.e. some kind of salvation. And there's always got to be some a happy ending. Um, so I think, uh, yes, there's, I mean, referrals are great. But to, to answer your question, I think we can do a lot more cost effectively, you know, to, to better engage untapped, um, uh, whether it's mass affluent or, 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 or our net worth uh, customer bases. But I think we need to do that cost effectively. I, I think, uh, especially in these days where we're spending so little time outside and so little, so much more time inside and, you know, and, and, and looking at our, our, our PC screens, you know, then we do need to, um, to, to amp up that, you um, digital advertising and, and content marketing that, that kind of reach customers and potential customers through, you know, through digital, digital channels. And uh, Jonathan, how do you think Sandland can boost their brand awareness? Yeah, I mean, um, um, obviously I think yeah, the referrals will continue and, and, and that will be a, a bellwether uh, type of marketing. Uh, but um, what I've been most impressed with is actually uh, uh, the marketing department asked me to put money into a, uh, what we call uh, Sandlam on Demand, which is a, effectively a, a, a uh, social media uh, advertised service where you can um, get a, a meeting with one of our uh, financial planners for 45 minutes free of charge. Um, and I said, okay, okay, we'll try it. Um, and I thought this is going to be disappointing because we may, we'll get lots of small people uh, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but uh, small investments which are below our level or or at the bottom of our levels. What I did find was we had significant numbers of people with seven figures coming via this medium and converting and doing everything uh, virtually. Um, uh, and it proves that there is an appetite out there for uh, that level of digital interaction. Uh, and let's face it, but we're not a well-known brand. So it's not as though that the, it's a, an immediate call to action from, from seeing that type of advertising. Uh, but I've been really, uh, and I've, I've tripled the budget for it because it, it was pretty low and it was just a, uh, a, a no-brainer. So those are all out there. We've got to exploit those uh, uh, and, and find new areas. And if you want to move your customer base from the traditional wealth manager customer base of people, I think, I mean, if, in our uh, investment management business, our, our average uh, client age is 67. Um, and we, we lose 5% a year through death. So we uh, moving them to a generation X, Y, and Z, if you want to move that, that, that client base and, and that uh, proposition, then, then digitally is the only way you're going to do that. And... Um, Peter, do you agree or is any other thing? Oh, well, look, if, if I was to say that I didn't like referrals, um, I, I think I would be out of a job uh, tomorrow because uh, one of the big changes for us in, in Coots is to tap the wider the wider NatWest group, um, where I say that every you know, NatWest is the largest commercial bank. Um, every successful business has a wealth management need. So you know, 20% of our new clients are coming from referrals um, from the wider bank and, and long may it continue uh, and our digital marketing into the wider bank now um, is also as I said earlier around digital sales is also reaping extraordinary benefits and it's some of it's it's quite simple stuff I mean we our marketing used to be the same marketing email to every person in the wider bank irrespective of age sex what they did with us lending borrowing uh, investing and now we've got quite a number of different personas and these are, are tailored uh, to individual customer groups, uh, and we're getting four and five times um, the click-through rate and four and five times the success rate. Um, but on the on the marketing and the branding front, I, you know, when I open up glossy magazines and I see ads for, for wealth managers, yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, uh, I don't think it drives, drives much. I mean, may, maybe brand awareness. Um, we've got to get smarter as an industry around social media, so I agree with you, Jonathan. 
So we had a, um, a person who's not a client, who's a young black rapper, um, and he posted on, on YouTube um, a song, a rap, um, around how he wanted to get a, a Coots account for his girlfriend because he wanted to impress her. Um, completely unauthorised, break every IP book, rule in the book, you know, the logo, the whole thing. And you looked at it and went, well, what are we going to do about that? You know, do we? And then it just went through the roof. The, the number of impressions uh, on YouTube went went through the roof. And then equally, we, we got a mention, uh, one in, in BBC Click and then on, on Top Gear um, uh, of Coots. And it was quite, the Top Gear one was quite funny. Uh, completely, we had no idea it was, was happening. I'm a bit surprised it got through the BBC, to be honest. Um, and and the, the impressions and the to the website was extraordinary. So that we we're already doing it, but, but we're doing a lot more around social media. And then when we first started, people were going, oh, not sure about this, you know, you know, coots and uh, it's not the right thing. For younger people and even for, for older people, they're engaging in these, these mediums. Um, and we need to sell both our, um, our marketing messages, but also the messages of the industry messages as, as well. So it's here to stay. I hope you gave him a count, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, well, I'll talk to you offline about that, John. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And just noticing the time, I, I'm unfortunately going to have to bring this panel discussion to an end, but obviously it's great to hear that the music industry is supporting wealth management as well. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much to each of our panellists for sharing your very detailed views. And also th thanks again to each of our speakers and for our sponsors and helping to put this webinar together today. And to each of our listeners, um, I very much hope you enjoyed it and we'd be delighted to have you join us at some of our, um, our future webinars. So here we've got a, a couple of, based on ESG, obviously very much a hot topic and part of the discussion today. And then um, we move on to remuneration and who are the winners and losers in that respect. So full details of these can be found on the company website and how to register. Also all our future events are on there as well. And just a final reminder that the slides and uh, recording of today will be shared after the webinar. So thank you very much again for listening and have a lovely evening, everyone.